Greetings, everybody, and welcome to session five on the Gospel of John. I am the Reverend Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. It's a joy to be with you today, to be your guide, your host, your journeyman, your partner, as we continue on in this fascinating, incredible, and powerful book through uh, the fourth gospel. Uh, so as we have been looking at this story of Jesus, this is a very different story than what we get in the synoptics, a very different look at and a very different um, understanding of Jesus' work in the world. This is very much more uh, focused on a wisdom uh, basis, more spiritual story, more spiritual book than the synoptics. The synoptics are very much chronological, telling the story from A to B to C to D to E. John does go in a chronological order, but he really focuses more on the spirituality and the spiritual interaction of Jesus than he does uh, necessarily the, um, uh, any other kind of interaction, more narrative or uh, storytelling interactive. So, so we've, we've just really kind of gotten into um, the life of Jesus here. The first couple of sessions we talked about the prologue, which is most of chapter 1. It's kind of the prologue. Why should we follow this guy? Where does he come from? Where does his power come from? How is he different than any other teacher, leader? Uh, and, and you need to really understand that most of the religious leaders at the time, most of the religious leaders at the time, and, and really kind of even more so, I shouldn't say more so today, but sometimes it seems like it, but just as much today, you know, religious leaders didn't always garner trust through their actions. The, the leaders of the temple and the temple cult uh, during the time of Jesus, they ruled through fear. They used fear, they used disappointment, they used God's righteousness as a hammer on the people. They use God's righteousness as a, as a cudgel to beat people down and keep people in order and in line. And most people couldn't read. Uh, they didn't have access to the word. So the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the leaders were the ones that maintained the knowledge. And they would use the knowledge however they wanted to for the sake of their uh, power and for the sake of protecting their privilege. We're going to see this uh, as we move into the scriptures as we move into the gospel more deeply. And we see it in the, in the synoptic gospels too. But Jesus is this very approachable, very down-to-earth Savior. And we see him, I mean, this is God come close. I mean, we saw it in the baptism. We saw it last week in the, uh, um, in, in the story of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus bails out the bridegroom who, you know, didn't prepare his, his, his wedding with enough wine for the party. So, Here's Jesus, you know, he's doing his thing. Jesus is doing his thing. Jesus is out there, but he is definitely meant to be seen as this very interactive, very accessible God. Because, he, because we want God to be accessible. That's the whole point of the incarnation. The whole point of Jesus coming down to earth is so that God is accessible. So that you can access God in a way that is, is beneficial and worthy. Um, and intimate and authentic and desirable. You know, throughout the centuries, the leaders wanted to create God as one who didn't want to be engaged with the people, didn't want to be bothered, kind of like the, kind of like the dad that disappeared into his study after dinner to smoke his pipe and read the paper and didn't want the kids to bother him. Everything needed to be quiet. That's not the way God is presented. God doesn't present that way, and God doesn't desire that. God wants to be. God desires to be interactive and connected to us. So with that being the case, and with that being the circumstance, God desires this, um, this intimacy with us. And so we have this very intimate Savior who uh, becomes very intimately involved in the work of the people. So that's what we're going to see unfolding here. And that's really one of the key pieces that we want to make sure we get out of our interaction with Jesus is this intimacy, this connection. All right, so um, let's see where we're at here. So uh, before we jump in, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. I would certainly encourage you to go back and listen to the previous sessions because we we're really kind of building session to session. Uh, it will make sense standalone, but also it will make even more sense as we build and as we grow and as we understand the book from 
uh, from session to session. So this is session five. If, you, if you're just joining us this week, thank you. It's beautiful and wonderful to have you here. Thank you for the opportunity. But certainly, certainly take the chance. Go back and, re- and, and listen to the previous sessions so that, um, so that you can be up to speed. Also, as always, I encourage you to have a Bible open before you. Uh, it can be up on the screen. It can be a digital copy or a, a printed copy, whatever. But the point is having the Word open so you're reading it. So you're not just hearing it, but you're seeing it with your eyes. You're hearing it with your ears. You're fully enveloping the Word. It's so important for us as believers to be totally in the Word, to be to be involved in it, to read it, to hear it. Because one of the challenges of being a Christian, one of the challenges of, of Christianity uh, is, is, in my opinion, is biblical ignorance, bibl- biblical illiteracy. We want to take the Bible and break it down into sound bites, which is what the rest of the world has done, or we want to take the Bible and just hold on to a few things. But we really, as believers, need to be in the Word, fully in the Word. We need to be completely enveloped in the Word. So knowing it, reading it, being able to engage it, knowing where everything is at, Vitally important for our walk with the Savior. Okay, so we're in the Gospel of John. John is the fourth book in the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John is the fourth Gospel. New Testament is the second half of the Bible. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, uh, concludes about 400 years before Jesus. It tells the story of God's creation and God's work with the Israelites, uh, the establishment of the Promised Land, the, the, the covenant with David, all that kind of stuff. And then the New Testament begins with the revelation of Jesus and goes through the, the, the now and then future church into what would be known as the Apocalypse, which we studied in the book of Revelation, which you can find on this YouTube channel if you wish. I did a uh, almost 50-part series on the book of Revelation back in 2020. So scroll down to the bottom part of, of, the, uh, of the YouTube channel and you'll probably find that. I would certainly encourage it. It's a really good study on the book, but... And not just because I did it, because it you know it's good to study that book and study that information. So we are in the Gospel of John, fourth book in the New Testament. We're in the second chapter now. We just concluded the wedding at Cana, uh, which is the first eleven verses of the chapter, and then we tackled that twelfth verse yesterday or last week. Sorry about that. Um, about Jesus' mother and his brothers and his disciples, and and the idea. The idea that Mary, the mother of Jesus, went on to have other children. See, now there are some, and I, and I touched on this last week, but there are some who want to confess that Mary remained permanently a virgin. That, that, that Mary and Joseph never engaged in marital intercourse after the birth of Christ. Now, accepting the virgin birth as, is something that we are capable of doing. But once Mary gives birth, then what she does afterwards, how she lives as a, as a wife afterwards, is of little consequence to the virgin birth of Jesus. Uh, so so there, 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 there's, no, there's no doctrine, there's no place in the Bible that says that Mary remained perpetually a virgin. There are places that can be argued semantically, that Jesus' brothers and sisters are cousins. And there is also the argument that Joseph, uh, Jesus' earthly father, was married prior to Mary and had children prior to Mary. There are arguments that put this in play. Um, and those arguments are, are accepted by you know certain faith structures. We don't accept them as, Christ- as Lutherans. We don't accept that Mary never had intercourse with Joseph after the birth of Jesus. We accept that Jesus was born to a virgin, but we don't accept that once Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph never had marital intercourse because they're human. There's a, there's a humanness to this story that we don't want to overshadow. There's a humanness to this Jesus that we don't want to overshadow. So we don't want to go down the road of, of, of proclaiming that Mary and Joseph weren't actually human, because that, that takes away from Jesus' humanity more than it does bolster it up. So in, in verse 12, we see that Jesus went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Now let me be clear. Let me be clear. Historically, historically, a healthy married couple would not have one child. 
In our world today, because infant mortality rates are so low and it's so very expensive to raise a child, and because we don't give birth to children in order to have them work the farm or work the family business or what have you, or depend on them to create an income at the age of 9 or 10, it is common for us to have one child or families have one child or two children or what have you. I, in my own current structure, as many of you know, I have one child. Um, but in the ancient world, that having one child would have been unheard of. I mean, the fact that having one child and that child grows to adulthood is, 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 is a risk. But to have one child and, and not have any more, that's a financial lunacy. You have children in order to create a financial reality. The more children you have that can work and provide, the, the better your financial reality is. So, so the, just the natural idea that Mary and Joseph after housing the Christ child, after giving birth to the Christ child, would never have intercourse again is historically, and, and it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. I'm sorry to my, my brothers and sisters who hold on to Mary's perpetual virginity, but that just doesn't make sense from a natural, historical, everyday living standpoint. And if we have a Savior who's all human and all in and really makes sense, it doesn't make sense for Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph, his earthly father, not to have any kind of intercourse or have any other kind of children. That just doesn't fit within the bounds of what I would consider realistic, both as a pastor and also just as a human being. I mean, that's just unrealistic as a human being to consider that to be the case. All right, so then now we're at verse 13. Uh, so the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the table. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of, my, out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, What sign will you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. All right. So a couple things that we get here. So first and foremost, what we have is we have some historical reference. It's the Passover of the Jews. Now, the Passover is extraordinarily important back in the Old Testament about passing over. That's the, the 10th plague, the angel of death um, that was sent upon Pharaoh for not releasing the Jews. So very much, again, this idea of redemption and restoration. And it's very clear, Jesus... Um, went up to Jerusalem to go to the Passover, which this was a requirement of any Jew at least once in their time. They had to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. It was part of the it was part of the religious order of the time period. So this shows that Jesus is a good Jew. Jesus is not looking to um, destroy Judaism. He's not looking to undo. Judaism. He's not looking to deny his roots. He is a good Jew. He's doing good Jewish things because he is a good Jew. He's up doing the Passover. He's up celebrating the Passover, which is the requirement of every Jew. So not only do we get a timeline here, not only do we get a historical marker, but we also get a look into Jesus' piety and his zealousness. He's a Jew. And not a marginalized Jew, but a devout Jew. He is one who believes in his place as someone of the people of Abraham. Now, this is really important because if he's going to be the Messiah, Messiahs don't crop up from the Gentile line. If people are going to claim him to be the Messiah, then he needs actually to, be, to have messianic pedigree. And you don't have messianic pedigree when you're coming from the Gentile line. You need that Jewish pedigree if, you are going to, if, it's, if, if someone is going to claim you as the Messiah. So Jesus has this messianic pedigree. 
he has this idea, this this identity as um, a Jew, so he can claim his messianic pedigree uh, for the sake of the people. And he goes up to Jerusalem, so he is fulfilling the duty that is laid forth upon people of all faiths. He is a good Jew. And I know I've repeated that a couple of times, but my friends, I hate to say this, but there are many, there may even be those of you, those in the pews next to you, who want to believe that Jesus was a Gentile and he hated the Jews. That's not the case. Jesus was a Jew, a good Jew. The scriptures tell us that he was raised in the Jewish faith, circumcised on the eighth day, all that kind of stuff. Jesus is all in, in the Jewish realm. He is all Jew. And he needs to be. He needs to be. Because if he is going to be redeemed, if he's going to be the redeemer of of the faith, then he needs to be all in as a Jew for the sake of Judaism. All right. So Passover, we get a historical reference, and we also get um, uh, his, his zealousness as a Jew. Now, the other thing that we get when we see Jesus getting to the Passover, is we see that the, that in the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and money changers seated at the tables. All right, before we, before we get too far, we need to understand that the temple was the center of marketplace, uh, particularly for those who were on pilgrimage. So if everybody was required to go to the temple and... Uh, You're coming from all over the land, and part of the temple was to have a temple sacrifice. Uh, So you went up to the temple to offer a burnt offering and a sin offering for to to please God. Well, you didn't want to carry two turtle doves or or two pigeons from the hinterland of northern Israel. You just bought them when you got there, and you know what? And there was there was people coming from all over the land. You know, much like today, if you go to Canada. If you want to spend money in Canada, you've got to convert into Canadian money, unless you're like right at the border. If you're up in Niagara Falls, sometimes you can spend American money on Canadian things. But you get much beyond that. You've got to convert your money into um, Canadian money. So coming to Jerusalem, if you were coming from Ethiopia or if you were coming from Scandinavia or if you were coming from Turkey, you needed to convert your money in order for people to... um, in order for you, able to, to, for you to be able to use it in the land. And, and so there had to be someone there to convert money. And if you were coming to offer a sacrifice, then there needed to be someone there to offer the sacrifice, to buy the sacrifice, to offer the sacrifice. So if we think of the temple, so there's the, you know, I'll try to draw you a picture. It's a rectangular building, um, and it sits up on a hill, okay? So then there's an enclosed part, which is the temple, and then there is the enclosed enclosed, which is the Holy of Holies. God resides in the Holy of Holies. The priests reside in the temple. And then the people are able to engage in the porch, the portico, the the outside of the temple. The people couldn't go into the temple proper. That was the priests. And then only one priest could go into the Holy of Holies. So when Jesus gets there, he finds the money changers not necessarily in the building itself, but outside the building where the people were. And they were crowding out the worshipers. So coming to the temple was less of a spiritual process and more of a consumer interaction. So it didn't matter your sins. It didn't matter your faith in God. You came to the temple by a turtle dove. Priest takes it in, sacrifices it with your sins, and Bob's your uncle, and everybody's great. It didn't matter... um, the spiritual connotation of things. So when Jesus gets there and sees this, it's not that he is is ignorant of what is supposed to happen. It's not that he's ignorant of the commerce. What he's bothered by is the fact that commerce has encroached spirituality. So the people of God can't get to God because they have to go through the money changers and the, the dealer of things. Well, <clears throat> Jesus decides that this is going to change. Now, we want to be careful here because there's a part of people that want to say that Jesus is angry. So, you know, it says, making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple, both the sheep and the, and the cattle. Now, when someone is, 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 is herding cattle or sheep, they're not angry when they're whipping the whip. They're just whipping the whip. That's how people are going to, that's how the animals are going to move. 
So there's some depiction that Jesus is angry about what is happening in the temple, and maybe he is. Maybe anger is the part of the play, but it doesn't seem like the whole part. Zealot. Jesus is a zealot, but zealots don't usually get angry. They get passionate. And I know I'm, I, I don't want to sound like I'm splitting hairs here because I don't mean to. This isn't about splitting hairs. There's, there's a big difference between passion and, 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 and anger. Anger is a response. Anger is a, a, a reaction where passion is a statement, a, a, a place of being. So Jesus, more out of passion than anger, clears the temple, does away with this um, financial reality, this financial burden, so that the people can get to God. That's the whole point. Jesus wants to make sure that the people have access to God. So he drives out the sheep and the cattle. He, he, he drives out the commerce. He cleanses the temple, as it's called, so that... Um, so that, so that people can come to the temple to worship. Now, maybe you've seen this. Maybe you've seen this. Now, now here at St. Paul's, we don't do this because, um, I, I, I mean, we do, we do have people that sponsor bulletins, but, but we, don't, we don't sell advertisements in our bulletins. Some, some churches do. Some churches sell advertisements in their bulletins. I, and, and my challenge with that is because it, it creates then an unclean temple. Um, and, and an unclean circumstance in my mind. So we don't do that here because when we come here, we come here to focus on God and on God's work and on God's call and on God's mission. That's, that's the point. That's the, that's the, the, the struggle that we have here. Um, so we don't sell advertising in our publications. We don't, we don't turn the church into an avenue of commerce. But what happened was that, you know, the temple priests were turning their backs on what was going on, most likely because they were getting some money in return. They were getting some kickback um, from the dealers in return. But the, 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 the priests had turned their backs on everything so that, you know, so that people were getting their, you know, able to sell their wares. And you can imagine... You can imagine, like a beer at a baseball game, a pigeon, which probably should cost like half a penny in the marketplace, was going for a buck. Because it was it was a it's supply and demand. I mean, you know, you either you either carried a pigeon all the way from from Galilee, hoping the darn thing didn't die, or you paid an outrageous premium to get a pigeon here in town. Um, and that's what they were depending on. And then the priest got a little bit of a kickback, and dealers got a little bit of a kickback, and somebody else got a little bit of a kickback. And all the while, the, the, the sacrificial system, which was meant to be a cleansing system, has turned into an, to a financial racket that, that people who don't need to be getting rich are getting massively rich, while the poor continue to struggle in their poverty. You can see how this would, this would cause Jesus to have a little bit of a passionate outbreak. It would cause me to have a little bit of a passionate outbreak, too. Besides, the temple was never meant to be a center of commerce. It was never meant to be used as something to make money through. It was always meant to be a place to come to God. Now, can, can commerce happen around the temple? Absolutely. But the temple had become a house of commerce, not a house of worship. Um, so he overturns the tables, pours the money out, does, just, just, just kind of runs amok, getting rid of everything. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. This come, that comes from Isaiah. Uh, zeal for your house will consume me. Um, so the idea that, that, that Jesus is all in, that he's investing in the house, and the house of God, that would be the temple, and that he would be fighting for it. Again, this is very messianic. This is very... Um, this is very zealot in the Jewish faith. And we see zealots like that all the time. This is very invested in the old ways, in the old stuff, returning to a pattern that isn't filled with corruption and consumerism. Um, and it's ultimately that, that stance against um, corruption, consumerism, that, that, that Jesus is going to get crucified for. Because he's going to call the leaders to act like righteous people of God and they're going to kill him for it. Um, they're going to crucify him for a, as a rebel because he's calling the people back to a stronger and more intimate relationship with God.
It's amazing how sin uh, can can manipulate and awful and and obfuscate what's going on. But that's exactly what happens. I mean, Jesus dies because he called people back to God, and the people and the leaders wanted to just continue to have them as their own puppets, as their own money-making scheme. So Jesus shows his passion for the house, his passion for God, and his passion for purity. You know, I, I think that's one of the things that we struggle with as believers, as followers of God, is that there is a desire for a sense of purity, a sense of separatedness, a sense of holiness. We don't want to make God just like everything else, because God isn't just like everything else. There is a purity and a sense of difference to being with God and being part of God. So so Jesus drives him out, stop making my father's house a marketplace, bring back the spiritual essence, the spiritual aspect of the temple. That's what Jesus is trying to do here. Uh, and his disciples remembered it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the disciples, it, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell, you know, when John talks about or says, you know, the disciples remembered or it was remembered. Uh, and we're going to see it actually a couple of times. It says, you know, the disciples remembered zeal for your house will consume me. Does that remembrance happen as they're watching it? It's like, oh, you know, Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy of zeal for your house consuming me while it's going on in real time. Or is this later uh, as the disciples have been revealed and have been filled with the word and the Holy Spirit? One of the things that we certainly need to keep in mind is that the disciples were not educated men. They were everyday blue collar workers. They were not educated men. So it's it's highly unlikely that they would know um, the, the and be able to quote the scriptures, quote the prophet Isaiah, or quote um, Ezekiel, or quote the Psalms. These were reserved for uh, the elite, the educated. And really, quite frankly, that was the case up until the early 1800s. I mean, look, early 1800s, a lot of people couldn't read. Early 1900s, a lot of people couldn't read. Luther really fought against that idea. So somewhere... Uh, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and they're connecting uh, past statements to present actions. That's that's how it works out. I mean, you know, when you look at the life of Jesus, and we're going to see this in, in the Gospel of John. We see it a lot in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus' current actions connect to past prophecy or past statements of faith. Because if Jesus is from the line of David, we need to find historical connection to be able to make that happen. So we're seeing this as zeal. Zeal for your house will consume me. Not anger, but zeal. Now, upon doing this, the Jews... Now, when John says the Jews... All right, I want to make sure that we're clear about this. And I'm going to try to, 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 to reframe it and make sure that we're, we're all in good standing here. It's not the whole country of Israel. When John refers to the Jews, he's referring to the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the leaders, the ones who are trying to keep the nation of Israel some backwater little nation under the Roman thumb because they're the ones that are getting rich. They're the ones that have the power. So it's the leaders. When John talks about the Jews, he's talking about the leaders of the, of the national state, of the national uh, identity. Now, again, as, as Americans, we really struggle with this, but I want to make sure that we're clear. Um, in Jesus' time, being a Jew was both a religious identity and a national identity. We look at ourselves as Christians. That's our religious identity, and our national identity is American. And though there are those who would like to interweave the two of those together, they are two separate identities, and they respond separately in different ways. As a Jew, you were both a, a spiritual Jew and a national Jew, and they were interweaved together. There was no, um, there was no separation one to the other. So, when John talks about the Jews, he's talking about the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawmakers, the controllers, the power brokers. He's not talking about the regular, everyday Jewish man or woman who are just scraping to get by and make a living. That's not who he's talking about. So as we engage the word, 
as we engage the Bible, we need to make sure that we're clear about that so we are not looking at, you know, looking at the Jews as um, just the people. That's, that's not who it is. It's the Pharisees and the scribes. Okay, so they say to Jesus, what sign can you show us for doing this? Who do you think you are? What right do you have? What power do you have to do this? Now, they know that they're doing wrong, okay? That's the thing. Why do they not just rebel against him and arrest him? Because they know that they're doing wrong. What they want to do is they want to discredit him. They want to discredit him, then they can arrest him. Because once they discredit him, once they make a mockery of him, then it's all about him and not about them. This is classic political power mongering is what they're doing here. What they're doing here is they're asking Jesus, what right do you have to do this? Because they don't, they, they don't want to arrest him because most of the people are like, look, this is what's happening. Finally, someone's standing up and they get arrested for it. But at the same time, uh, so the people know that it's wrong, but they don't have any power to fight against it. So what the, what the, what the leaders are trying to do is they're trying to bring Jesus down by questioning him. And his response is, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Now this, now of, of course, here is the double entendre, the double, the double meaning of the word temple. Because what we're getting is we're getting two things here. The Pharisees are hearing Jesus talking about the temple, the structure, the building, the bricks, the porticos, the archways. They're thinking that, they're, that he's talking about the temple that they're standing in which is how they respond. This temple's been under construction for 46 years, and you're telling us you can build it in three days. Well, Jesus could if he wanted to. I mean, yeah. I mean, he could do that. There's nothing that says he couldn't. He has the power and the capability to build the temple in three days. I mean, come on, he created the world in seven. I think Jesus can handle a little building in three days if he really wanted to. However, he's not talking about the building. He's talking about his body. He is foreshadowing his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, we don't get the word crucifixion. We don't know that he's going to the cross, not yet. But he does. He sees the end of this story. He sees where this is going from the beginning, which is really kind of fascinating because it, it does lead into some really deep questions about how much did Jesus know? Was the cross always an inevitable or did the cross become an inevitable when the people couldn't or wouldn't buy into Jesus? You know, in the Synoptic Gospels, there is the story of the Transfiguration, where it seems like that's the point where Jesus hears that he's going to the cross, hears that he's going to die, that the mission has changed for some reason. But in John, we're very early in, and Jesus is already talking about his death and resurrection. Destroy this body, and in three days I will raise it up. Um, so we very much get this sense of something major, big, and drastic happening to our Lord and Savior uh, in the midst of the story. And he knows it very early on, which is fascinating because it's, it's from John that we get the idea that Jesus' earthly ministry was three years, okay? Uh, we think of Jesus being 33 when he dies, and um, that comes through a number of historical markers and the such. But ultimately, it's through John that we see Jesus' ministry about three years because we get three Passovers. On his third Passover is when he's crucified and rises from the dead. So, so if, if, if that's accurate or any, anywhere near accurate, then Jesus is known for three years, that he is ultimately going to die, that he is ultimately going to give his life in service of the divine, and that in three days he's going to rise from the dead. So if, if that's the case, then, you know, it, Jesus has known this. He has known this. He's been fully aware of this. It's the full agency of his divinity. He knows what's going to happen, but it is, hum, it is, it is his humanity that contains that within this earthly world. That's a very hard concept for us to grasp. It's a concept that we really struggle with grasping. But we grasp it nonetheless. So, so they ask, what sign can you show us for doing this? Yeah, there's no sign that you can show for doing this. So we're going to discredit you, then we're going to arrest you. That's the play. That's, that's the hustle that the, that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees are engaging in. That's the con. 
we're going to discredit you, then we're going to arrest you because people are going to shake their head and they're going to think you're an idiot and they're going to laugh at you. And then we're going to ultimately quietly push you away. And then when you're gone, we'll execute you and nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to care. That's all that matters. That's that. That's the play. What they don't get is that they're trying to play chess with a chess master. This is like trying to, this is like a four year old trying to teach Tesla about electricity. It's not going to work. They're trying to play him, but they don't know how. Because he says, you know what? I mean, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Well, they're not going to destroy the temple. They're not going to tear down what's been done for 46 years. They wouldn't hedge their bet. This guy isn't that big. So they're going to mock him. This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you think that you can build it up in three days? They're going to mock him, but they're not going to. I mean, they asked for a sign. He told them what to do. They're not going to do it. Now, I would imagine if they really, really trusted him enough to tear down the temple in three days, that he would raise it back up again. But that's not where they're going, and that's not where he's going. So they asked for a sign. He gave them what he would consider a sign, and they didn't follow through. But ultimately, he's talking about his crucifixion, his death. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. So really, again, we see that, that all throughout his earthly ministry, the disciples do have this, this sense of doubt, this sense of question. It is not until they're filled with the Holy Spirit after the resurrection, when the scriptures are fully opened up to them, that they have this full awareness. They are far less buying in than we would like to think that they are. Um, so, you know, Jesus is indicating that part of the messianic journey is going to be death. And look, he's telling his disciples this early, too. They need to know that at the end of this journey is not going to be a throne and crowns, but the end of this journey is going to be crucifixion. And they need to be okay with that, because if they're not okay with that, then there's going to be struggle and challenge. So if they're going to buy in, they need to buy in now. All right, chapter, uh, verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what is in everyone. Okay, so let me break this down here just real quickly to try to figure this out. Jesus is up at the, the, the festival in Jerusalem, and he's doing many things, like turning water into wine, like driving people out of the temple, like healing and um, offering cures and teaching and wisdom. He's doing all these wonderful and beautiful things. He is doing the messianic work, and people believed in him. People believed that he was the one, but he would not allow, and, and it says he would not entrust himself to them. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone. Uh, for he himself knew what was in everyone. So, so he wasn't allowing, he wasn't trusting anyone to verify anybody else. You know, you get that moment where, hey, let me, you know, I want you to meet my brother because he's a really good guy and he really is got a, he's got a good heart only he's struggling how many times have we said that about somebody he's got a good heart only he's struggling jesus is the son of god jesus is capable of of being part of everybody's life because he made life so he doesn't need anyone to speak on someone else's behalf he does not need an introduction to anyone this is what makes him different. He can see into. He knows the realm and the fit. He knows where people are at. So because of this, Jesus isn't going to entrust himself to anyone. Jesus isn't going to look to anyone uh, to, you know, to, to, to bring people in or to speak on their behalf. He knows everyone. This is his divinity. This is part of his divine nature. What the writer of the gospel wants us to know is that Jesus has the omniscience of God. That Jesus has the, the, the all-knowing, the all-present. That Jesus, though contained in finite form, is in fact the infinite. 
that Jesus hasn't sacrificed part of his, his divine nature to become human. Now, this is really hard for us to grasp on an intellectual level, and that's kind of the point. We're not really supposed to grasp this on an intellectual level. We're really kind of supposed to, to live into the faith in this. But Jesus knew what was in everyone. Jesus knew how to read people. He knew how to see into people. Now, and I, I don't know how, okay? I, I don't know if Jesus had a, uh, you know, a human Rolodex in his divine brain that every time he came across someone, that Rolodex popped up that person with their personnel file. It, it's unclear exactly how it works out, but what we do know, what we do know is that Jesus has the capability of understanding and knowing people at a deeper level than even they know themselves. So Jesus doesn't need anyone to verify, testify, justify, entrust. Jesus doesn't have to look to Peter in order for Peter to tell him about this guy over here, about whether Peter knows him or not. Jesus already knows him. And Jesus isn't going to play any games here. He's not going to play any political wrangling. He's not interested in elevating anybody beyond the status or place that they need to be. This is not a power play to get to Jesus. It's not a power play to get to God. This is authenticity and divinity and grace. And that's what we see here today. All right, so I'm going to leave it here, folks. We're going to stop at this point. Uh, if you have any questions or qu anything like that, again, my contact will pop up at the end of the session. You can go ahead and feel free to reach out to me, um, and I'll do my best to get back to you in the midst of uh, in the midst of the next session, or I'll reach out to you directly or what, whatever whatever is best. But if you have any questions or thoughts or comments, feel free to reach out to me. I uh, will probably dig back on this last piece a little bit more before we press forward, just so we're like abundantly clear about what we're going to get. So um, God bless you. I hope this has been a good session for you. I hope I hope this is a good series. I hope that you're enjoying this series and that you're able to get something out of it. So far, it's been a blessing for me to be able to do it. So I look forward to continuing to do this into the future. So God bless you today. Whatever the rest of your day brings, whether you're hearing this at the premiere or you're listening to it later, whatever it brings, I pray that it is wonderful and, and blessed. And I will talk to you next week.